Father, we just thank you for this evening, this morning. <laughs> Lord, we approach your book of Revelation. Lord, we know now it's the revelation of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us on the cross. And Father, we ask this morning to make this so crystal clear that we as a people, as your body, will be able to stand, oh God, in the face of the lies we've heard about the millennium, about the thousand-year reign, about the battle of Armageddon. And Father, we commit this time into your spirit. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to come among us and, Lord, give us the insight that John was given. And Father, we thank you for it. We ask you for it. You say we have not because we ask not. We ask this morning for it. And Father, we receive it done in Jesus' name. And Father, we ask you also with the insight to give us wisdom in how to share this. Lord, whoever you, with whomever you bring across our path, let us, O oh Lord, not, O oh God, uh, back up, O oh God, to the lies that the church has bought in this hour. But Father, give us the boldness, give us the wisdom, and give us the anointing, O oh God, to be able to destroy any lie that we have brought face to face with, O oh God, in our walk as we walk with you. And we ask it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. We've been talking here so far, we're up to the 20th chapter, and the 20th chapter still has to do with part of the vision that was given that began in the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation. And uh, in this 20th chapter, it's, it's, it's the beginning of the last vision, vision number seven. But also, it's going to show you the ultimate end of Satan. And we already know what that ultimate end is, don't we? It's destruction in the lake of fire for all eternity. And so in beginning this 20th chapter, and also the 21st chapter, and also the 22nd chapter, I really feel in my heart that these are three of the most awesome chapters in the Bible because it has to do with the summation of what the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is all about. And so when we begin to look at this 20th chapter, as in all visions that we've seen so far in this book, it begins by pointing us back to the cross. I think for the most part that we have not understood clearly the cross. Most of us have known so little about the cross. And I watch just how we have made uh, the communion table of the Lord just some ordinance or just some ceremony, like some holiday that we take part in, like little good children saying, see God, I took communion, but there's no heart ascent given to it. But these visions are clearly understood if we can understand the language of the Holy Spirit. So let's just begin at the 20th chapter. First of all, I want you to keep these thoughts in mind. It points back to the cross. You're going to see in this 20th chapter, it's going to point to the day of salvation, also known as a thousand year reign of Christ. It's going to talk about those that accept his redemption, that will reign with him. We're going to also see the day of final judgment for those that reject his reign, and also the final reign, or the final judgment, excuse me, I should say, the final judgment of Satan. So in this 20th chapter, verse 1, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven. The word angel can also be the word messenger. Those words are inexchangeable. Coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old. And again, we see the symbolism. He tells you he's a serpent. He tells you he's a dragon. Notice the, the symbolic language right away. Dragon, serpent. And now he tells you who it is. Who is the devil and Satan? And he bound him for how long? A thousand years. Now remember, this is a book of symbolism. And the biggest lie that holds the people of God in the church today in bondage is trying to wait for God to come down and do something extra other than the cross and to keep talking about a thousand year millennium reign off in the future. And we have literally fulfilled the prophecies of Daniel that told us that Satan would destroy God's people by bringing about a change in times and seasons. And I think today we'll see that. This thousand years has to do with how God sees a thousand years and what God calls a thousand years. We are looking at two different understandings in the body today. One, man has his understanding of a thousand years and he translates his from the natural life. Is that right? 
but God has his understanding of a thousand years and he translates his from the move of his spirit. Total world difference. It's like he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. It's like my thoughts are as high as the heavens from the earth. He's saying to us, my ways of sin a thousand years are not your ways of sin a thousand years. And so we got all this confusion in church and this is usually one of the things that if you ever touch, you will put your finger in Satan's eye and that's when you have all hell come against you. And I'm trying to see God raise up an army that's not afraid to stand in the face of the lies and say, that's a lie and here's why. That's what we prayed this morning, what we prayed. Now, first of all, is it really an angel that came down from heaven? We know that this has to be Jesus. And the reason we know it's Jesus because no angel do we find anywhere seems to be able to come face to face with Satan and do with him what he want to do with him. For example, case in point is the book of Jude. Go there for a moment. But I'm going to show you that this, this is Jesus. Now, Jude has one chapter. And that ninth verse gives you an idea about archangels and their dealings with Satan who also was an archangel. Is that right? Notice what happens with Michael. Now, most, of, most people consider Michael to be the strongest archangel. We know another archangel is Gabriel. Is that right? We know also that Lucifer was a created archangel. And it seems, according to the scriptures, that Lucifer was the strongest of all the archangels. He had the highest place in God's order. But when these archangels begin to deal with one another, I want you to see how they deal with one another. Jude verse 9, but Michael the archangel, when he disputed with who? The devil. The devil. Is that Lucifer? Is that Satan? Amen. He argued about the body of Moses. Now remember, Moses had grown angry and struck the stone. And so Satan was literally saying, Moses belongs to me. And they were arguing over the body of Moses. But notice how the archangel treated Satan, who also was an archangel. He says, he did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment. That's why I'm amazed by watching so many of us in charismatic Pentecostal circles make fun of the devil. Folks, he is a being that we're no match for. Amen. We said things like, Satan's stupid, he's crazy, and all these little terms we give him. Let me tell you people something. I remember one day when I was caught up in that, and the Lord spoke to me very clearly as, if I've, as I've ever heard him. He said to me, Satan's been destroying flesh like yours for centuries. He's a master at it. And who do you think you are bringing accusations against him? And that's the same thing you'll see here. The Bible says this archangel did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment. And here's what he said to him. The Lord rebuke you. Do you see that? Who did he say would rebuke him? The Lord. The Lord deals with the devil. Do you see that? And so the reason I'm telling you this because... Most people, when they read this, think that some angels come in and grab the hold of Satan. No, it doesn't work that way. This is Jesus. How do I know it's Jesus? Go to Revelation chapter 1. I'll show you how I know it's Jesus. In Revelation 1, verse 18... Jesus says, I'm the living one, and I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the what? Keys. Now, what's the real meaning of that word keys? Authority. Everybody tell me. It's what? Authority. He's the only one that has the authority. He has the authority of what? He tells you. Of death and of Hades. What is Hades? Hell. Hell. So would you begin to say, this must be Jesus? Look what else he said. Go to the book of Matthew. Matthew. The 16th chapter. And I want you to notice something here. Peter is given a revelation. I think one of the better definitions of the word revelation is something that the Holy Spirit gave me. Is a true heart understanding. A true heart grasping. 
of truth. And when there's a true heart understanding and a true heart uh, grasping of truth, I'm telling you right now, you can walk through hell in gasoline underwear. Or listen to me. It won't have no effect on you. Now that's a term we have in the world, but I think it, it, it gives the point that I'm trying to make here. It doesn't matter what you're to walk through. If you really know that you have been redeemed, that you have been baptized into Jesus, it doesn't matter what you got to walk through. It has no effect on you. That's what happened to Peter here. I don't know what caused Peter to be given this revelation. I don't know whether he was meditating on Jesus or whether the Holy Ghost just all of a sudden like he's done to me many times and I'm sure any other minister that has really sought truth, all of a sudden he had an awareness. That's what God means. I don't know what happened here, but I know that all of a sudden Peter was given a revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's what he says. In the 16th chapter, talking about keys, look at with me at the 18th verse. This is right after the Lord told him, Simon by Jonah, which, which is really son of John. And by the way, his name was Simon, which means one that blows along in, with any wind of doctrine. So that's been the problem in the church. Anytime a, a, a doctrine comes out in the church, quickly, it's like a bandwagon approach. Everybody jumps on the bandwagon of, like, like it's politics. Have you noticed that? For example, I watched how this man in, uh, um, in Texas perverted this uh, truth about could you not pray with me for one hour. All of a sudden, the whole church world had jumped on the bandwagon like God is impressed when we pray with him for one hour. And it was a rebuke. It wasn't meant to be something positive. It's always that way. I remember when the Lord first taught everybody in a session. All of a sudden, I mentioned in a session. I remember you were with me. And I began to teach it. I taught it one year in, in the church we were attending at the time before anybody in the church even heard of the word. All of a sudden, everybody started saying, I'm an intercessor. It became popularized. Are you following what I'm saying to you? Well, Peter was given a revelation here. It was something that wasn't so popular. It's amazing how God seems to deal with those of us in truth. And his truth is not popular to the flesh. And this man... He just jumped on any truth that come along. They were saying he was a good man. They were saying Jesus was a prophet. And all these things. But all of a sudden, this man's heart grasped truth. And from this point on, he was no longer called Simon by Jonah. He was called Peter. Because of the revelation he grasped, this man underwent a transformation of character and nature. And this man's character changed from being one that was blown in the wind by any wind that come along. Any storm could come along and, and blow him down. From this point on, he was called a rock, a little rock. In fact, I begin at verse 17. Jesus answered to him, blessed are you Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who's in heaven. And I also said to you, said to you that you are what? That's when he got his name changed. You are Peter, which means little stone. And upon this rock, he wasn't talking about building his church upon Peter. He was talking about building his church upon the truth, the rock, who is Jesus Christ. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. And notice this. And the authority or the gates of hell shall not what? Overpower it because of the revelation. Look what he says. And Jesus said, I will do this. He says, I will give you the what? There's the authority again of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Do you see that? And notice something else. That he warned his disciples to tell no one that he was a Christ. I want you to know that the Lord wants to reveal it by his spirit. Do you see that? Because in that day, this truth was not accepted. It would cost you a life in the day when Jesus walked to earth to go around openly proclaiming Jesus is the Messiah. You got your head chopped off or you've been nailed to a cross with him or oh, you hearing me. So we begin to see that when God gives the truth, he gives also the keys of the authority. Do you see that? Also, notice what he says in Matthew. We know this one pretty well. 28. He says very clearly the 18th verse, all authority 
or which means all the keys or all might or all dominion, keys, gates, or all symbols, all through the Bible for authority. Do you all, all agree with that? I think we know that by now. He's all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let's go back to Revelation 20, please. And let's see what he does with Satan. This is such a beautiful chapter. I, I approach this chapter in just energy from the Holy Ghost and just joy and just knowing what it means. So he laid hold of the dragon who is Satan, verse 2. He threw him into the abyss. He shut it and sealed it over him. And I don't want you to miss this. And what I'm reading in the first three verses is talking about what happened when Jesus died, was buried, and then he was resurrected. Everything I'm reading in these first three verses, that's all we're reading about. The cross is the very center of everything that's happening in this three chapter. Look what, the, look what it says in this, this third verse. He sealed it over him. Now, folks, let me tell you what happened to us. When we read this, because of the lie that was populated by Schofield and then picked up by Dakes and popularized and sold to us, we somehow got an envision that when Satan was bound and sealed up into the pit, then everything on this earth would then instantly be transformed into a panacea. If that fact had, had been truth, people, it would have proven that God the Father was a liar. God had condemned this world all through scripture, had he not? Yeah. And everything that was in the world, had he not? Yeah. And what made us think somehow that all of a sudden this planet would turn into an instant panacea of just bliss on this earth. And everything on this earth was already cursed. That's not what it says here. The Lord is telling us something. He said when he sealed it, something would take place in the earth that had not been able to take place before. And here's what took place when Satan was bound. And I'm going to show you from scripture this has to do with the work of the cross. So that he should not want deceive the nations any longer. Now folks, when the Bible talks about Satan deceiving the nations, I'm going to tell you, that's what's been happening in the church. That's why we have so many defeated Christians. That's why so many people are defeated in this very church. If anything comes against their life, it totally makes their faith shipwrecked to even believe God, what his word says. Have you noticed that? You saw what happened here Thursday night. Over half the church passed failed the test. To test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Over half of us in this church are not in the faith. We know nothing about the fight. But God says when this happens, he'll bring about an end to deception among the nations. Now this deception will be stopped until, and we get that term again, the thousand years were completed. Do you see that? And after these things, he must be released for a short time. Now, let me tell you what happened. The Lord told us very clearly that something would take place because of the cross. He also said to us, it was for this purpose that he came into this world. Is that right? To destroy the works of the devil. Now, are you saved? Talk to me. Does that mean that the works of the devil was destroyed in your life? Does that mean that you were released from the captivity of Satan somewhere in your life? Yeah. That was nothing Satan could do to stop you from coming to Jesus either, was it? Is that right? And when you heard the gospel, you knew it was the truth, didn't you? Yeah. You also knew it was the only way out. I remember when I was in the Philippines and um, the first time I preached there, I preached in Bilibad Prison. I made an altar call. I was on death row. And every man on death row came to Jesus. Wonder why the devil's power wasn't able to stop all those men from giving their lives to Jesus? I can tell you why. Because Satan was bound. And he's bound where the gospel goes forth. Oh, you listen to me. That's the binding of the devil. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. What it is, what is, is, it is proclaimed. It sets the captives free. How do I know? Because of Ephesians 4, 8. Let me show you what happened. He told us in Ephesians 4, 8 about this binding and loosing of the devil. 
In Ephesians 4, 8, it says, Wherefore it says, when he ascended on high. I got a question for you. When it talks about Jesus ascending on high, what is it talking about? Going to, Going to the throne. To begin his reigning and his ruling. Is that right? Isn't it amazing that even the natural, any king that sits on the throne, or even a queen that sits on the throne, will say she's reigning and ruling. But when it comes to Jesus, isn't it awful that the church that brags of all her power and her glory will not acknowledge that Jesus is reigning and ruling and keep saying it's for the future. Isn't it funny how when we are walking in this time of warfare and all of us have had to walk it, that all the church ever preaches about is the history of what happened in the past or what's going to take place way down the line in the future. Isn't it funny? It's never for the now. Here's what it says. And this was a prophecy that was given in Psalms. And Paul wrote Ephesians, and remember he said, I was given a revelation of Jesus. I was either taught it by man, neither did I learn it by man. Remember that? Amen. So he understood this prophecy. He said, wherefore it says, as the scripture says, or wherefore he says, in other words, when he ascended on high, think about it. It there, a better interpretation should be, he said this, Jesus said this, he. If you got a real good Bible, you might even say that in some of your Bibles. Because I've seen some Bibles where it will literally say, wherefore he says. When he ascended on high, now think about it. I want you to go back to the scene. Can you see in your mind when Jesus is ascending to glory? Can you see that picture in your mind? Got a question. What had just happened? The crucifixion, his resurrection, is that right? So that's again pointing to the sin of the cross. What did he do when he ascended on high? He led captive, a host of captives. Notice, Satan couldn't stop him. And what did he do? He gave gifts to men. Do you see that? Satan couldn't stop it anymore. He was bound. Now, when this word binding does not mean that God stopped his influence in the earth. See, that's the lie we bought. Is this making sense to you? Let me share another scripture that talks about this. Let's go to Psalm 68 from which this was really brought forth. What a beautiful chapter and how it's been so maligned and perverted. The 20th chapter, the 21st chapter, and the 22nd chapter. I listened to Brother Daniel talk about the pure heart, the jasper. You got everybody trying to see a literal city, not knowing it's the bride, it's us. Psalm 68, verse 16. Let's begin there. Why do you look with envy, O mountains with many peaks? These are the kingdoms of man. At the mountain which God has desired for his abode. Now what mountain is that? That's Zion. Is that right? Surely the Lord will dwell there forever. The chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Now think about that. As at Sinai, it's an example. But he's among them in what? Holiness. Now look at this prophecy. It points to the time the Spirit gave to David, the resurrection of Jesus. Thou has what? Ascended on high. Folks, has Jesus ascended on high? How in the world is it that we could acknowledge that he's ascended on high and we can't acknowledge the rest of it? And yet he tells you that this took place when he ascended on high. Thou has ascended on high and thou has led captive, what? Thou captives. Thou has received gifts among men, even among the rebellious also, that the Lord God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burden. That's after he ascended on high. The God who is our what? Again, it points to salvation. Our salvation. God is to us now a God of deliverances. And to God the Lord belongs escapes from death. 
Surely God will shadow the head of his enemies. Did he do that? This is after he ascended on high, folks. And then he begins to give the prophecies. The hairy crown of him who goes on in his guilty deeds. The enemies. The Lord said, I will bring them back from Basham. I'll bring them back from the depths of the sea. Folks, has God brought us out of captivity before? And then we got into these false perverted doctrines. Is God not again reaching down and bringing us out of these false doctrines again? Let me ask you something. Can Satan stop him? No. No, he's bound him. Are you seeing that? Let me show you another scripture. Do you believe that Jesus ascended on high? Yes. Let's see what it said he did when he ascended on high. Everything we're reading in this, this first uh, four verses, literally, is pointing to what has already occurred because of the work of the cross. Colossians 2, please. 10. And in him you be made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the by the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This happened, folks, when you accepted the truth. When you received the revelation, just like Peter received the revelation, you had a transformation in your character, in your nature. You had a whole transformation in your life from that point on. I don't care if you lived your life as a hypocrite. You couldn't live it in peace and enjoyment anymore. You couldn't do those things in peace and enjoyment no more because you came into, the, in, into contact with the truth. Is that right? You know that Jesus died for your sin, don't you? Whether you're still walking in sin or not. Something took place because you had a revelation of something. And no demon power of hell could stop you from believing that Jesus didn't die for your sins. You weren't there to see it. How come you could accept it so readily? Because Satan was bound. Now, we're going to follow that thousand years in a minute. I know we already know here. Look, having been buried with him in baptism. Folks, again, is that pointing to the cross? He says, I'm lifted up. I'll draw all men into me or unto me or to me. That's how you will bear with him in baptism. Not one of us in this room went back through the corners of time and said, hey, Jesus, hold up the crucifixion. Let me get inside of you. What would you do? Climb into him through his mouth? No, we took it by faith, didn't we? Yes. Satan couldn't stop us either, could he? Yeah. Look what he says. See, he's bound. In which you were raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions, because we'll see that term about those folks uh, that were dead didn't come to life until the first resurrection was over. This is the first resurrection when we were raised up with him. Is that not so? Your salvation is the first resurrection. And the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us. Folks, we all had a debt. None of us could pay it. And because of our debt to God, what we owed him, every curse that God wrote in this Bible was testifying against us. Is that not true? Those are the decrees. His judgment. The curses. The plagues. He's taken out of the way. Having nailed it to the cross. Now folks, here's when he led captivity captive. And set the captives free. Verse 15. This is all talking about when he died and rose from the grave. When he had what? Disarmed. Would you say that you could also say he bound them? Would you say bind them means to take away their authority? When he had disarmed the rulers and authority, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Do you see that? Again, I don't mean to keep beating a drum, but I'm going to keep beating until somebody hears it. I'm trying to make all the noise I can make. Go to Ephesians 1. Here's when Satan was bound for a thousand years. I used to wonder why Paul wrote the words he wrote. I know why he wrote them now. It's awful people to have a revelation of what really took place and then try to stand and tell people the truth. People, for the most part, don't want to hear the truth. They love the traditions of man. They love it. There is something about man that loves flesh fellowship more than God, more than staying alone with God. That's why Paul wrote these words in the 18th verse. He's talking to a people who had received salvation. 
And Paul was saying to them, you're still blind and don't know it. The Bible tells you in verse 1, he said he wrote this to saints and those that were faithful in Christ Jesus. Is that right? Would you say they had received salvation? Yeah. Look what he tells about these people. The same warfare that we're fighting in this church and on the radio every, every day. He says in the 18th verse, I pray that the eyes of your what? Heart may be enlightened, which means you don't have the enlightened your heart yet what this salvation is really all about. So that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Which means you don't know the riches of the glory. You don't even know your inheritance that you have. And it's for all the saints. He's, I'm praying somehow you get this illumination. I'm telling you now, over half this church don't have this illumination. That's why they still walk in sin, they still walk in defeat, they still walk in gospel, they still walk in slander, they still walk in everything else of, of the enemy. Look what he says here. He says, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? And everything about us believing, everything about our faith is tied where? To the cross. Everything about believing is tied to the cross. Everything about us trusting God is tied to the cross. He said, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead seating him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion this is when Satan was bound why don't we go into the second chapter again he talks about when you were dead in your trespasses and sin do you see chapter 2 verse 1 that's a key verse I'm going to come back to it in a few moments And then he says in verse 5, again, when you were, we were dead in our what? I got a question for you. We keep seeing this term. What, you beat me, Sister Harriet, were you going to read my mind? What does God call, who does God call dead people? Sinners. They can be alive in the earth, but God calls them dead. Is that right? Now don't miss that. Because you're going to see some folks, when the end comes, the whole world will have the illumination. And then they come alive and it's too late. And that's what's happened to the church. The whole church is caught up in this millennium doctrine. Captured. Think about what I'm saying. I don't know if you know the awesomeness what I see. I walk on this burden all the time. Seeing it. Captured with a lie. Because they gave their hearts to man and didn't search the scripture for themselves. And they've bought it. They've swallowed it. They've eaten it. And they've been put to sleep and they're in total ease waiting for God to come do something extra. Verse 6 says, even when 5, when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. All this is talking about being, being salvation. Being saved means salvation. Quicken us alive with him means salvation. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, let me show you something in Daniel 7. Now, we saw in Matthew 28, 18, that Jesus said all power in heaven and in earth has been given unto him. Now, do you know we can say that? We can quote, we can quote this scripture. But I'm going to tell you right now, the church don't believe this scripture. It's awful. It's awful to think of the blasphemy that we have been guilty of against the cross. In Daniel 7, we've seen this before. This is right after Jesus had left the earth when he was first resurrected from the grave and he ascended to his father and then he came back down to the earth and spoke. We already learned this in the past. Matthew 28, 18, he said to them, all power in heaven and in earth has been given to me. He said it had been given to him, which means he had to receive it from somebody. Is that right? Which means there had to be another person involved, another being involved to give him this power because Jesus never told a lie. He said, all power in heaven and in earth 
has been given to me, which means he accepted it, he received it. Is that right? And he began to also give gifts to us, give us some of that power and authority. Is that right? This is the only place in the Bible that tells you where he got it from. This is Daniel looking through the corners of time, seeing the results of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Daniel was shown the meeting. Daniel 7, 13, he's having visions, just like Revelation is a book of visions of the glory of Jesus. He says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Got a question for you. Does Jesus call himself the son of man? Yeah. Does that mean that he's the being that was born from human flesh, or came out of human flesh? Yeah. Son of man. He represents us in the heavens. Is that right? The Bible talks about there's only one man. That's the media between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. He's also God, but he's also called man. Is that right? Yeah. He sees the son of man. Coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days. We know that the Ancient of Days is God the Father, and he was prevented, presented before him. Here is where the power and the authority was given to Jesus. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, as nations, as and men of every language might serve him. That's why he told them, go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that every nation of the world would know that he's king, that he has the power, he has the authority, and all dominion is now in his hand. That was the purpose of the cross. Is that right? That all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which would not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Now, let's go back to Revelation. The 12th chapter. And notice the 7th verse. Folks, do you see where my heart breaks? Let me tell you something. You don't know. I, it wouldn't take much to push me on tears this morning. Thinking about the people that I know that are in bondage to this millennium lie. And all the men of God that claim they are men of God don't want the church to know about it because they say, we don't want to start any confusion. Now, I'm telling you what I've been told. We're talking about one of the greatest revelations that God ever gave to mankind. And preachers, because of their money, don't want it touched. If people start rising up and saying, wait a minute, what's going on here? They claim they love Jesus. No, they don't love Jesus. They love their money. This is one of the greatest things that God ever shared with me. I'm sharing with you today. Twelfth chapter. The seventh verse. And what I'm about to read about is what took place the moment Jesus ascended into glory. Are you ready for this? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. Now, so that some demon spirit won't talk to your religious spirit said, but wait a minute, I thought it was Jesus that did it. Jesus gave the authority. You saw what I'm saying to you? It was him doing it. Whether he did it through Michael or whether he did it personally. I don't know, I didn't see the vision. But it's the same truth. You follow what I'm saying to you? They were waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown where? Yeah. Down. The serpent of old who is called what? The devil. the devil and Satan. Who deceives the whole world. Again, we see this thing about deceiving the world. You see the same term again? Every time we see about Satan and him ruling and reigning, there's always something here about deception. It's the deception that's broken. It's this deception that's bound. Not his influence. He was thrown down to the earth and his angel was thrown down with him. And folks, when this happened, all of a sudden, a word went out from heaven. The moment Satan was bound and thrown down, a word was proclaimed from heaven. Watch what it says. 
It says now. Now, smart Alex, what does the word now always mean? Since the cross. Now, he says, now that Satan's bound and thrown down, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. Folks, Satan can only accuse us because of sin. Is that right? Because of the cross, can he still accuse us of sin if we accept it? Are you saying that he's telling you that because of the cross he was thrown down? Who accused him before our God day and night and they overcame him. These are people that accept the work of Calvary. How were they able to overcome him? Because they were worthy? No, because of the blood of the Lamb. And Hebrews says his blood gives testimony. Is that what it says in Hebrews 12? That the blood of Jesus speaks. And it speaks concerning us. It speaks concerning his work of redemption. Because of the blood of the Lamb. That's why we overcame him. And because of the word of their testimony, we have been studying, we've had seven tapes so far. And Daniel's supposed to do eight. Listen to me. We overcome because we so meditate in God's word. That all of a sudden our hearts comes in line with everything that Jesus has provided to us through Calvary. Two reasons we overcome. His shed blood and the word. God's word becomes our testimony. And they didn't love their life, even the death. Now that death is talking about is the same death it talked about Jesus in Philippians 2. That because of his name that he was given, he became obedient to death. That means dying to all independent living. That is not talking about a physical, literal death. It means dying to serving self. And they love not their lives even to death, which means we stop loving our carnal, sinful, lustful, prideful nature, nature in this world. And we literally gave our lives up before his altar as a living sacrifice. That's what it's talking about. It talks about Jesus with two deaths. It says he became obedient to death. Then it says even death on the cross. Two different deaths. Amen. And then it says, for this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Do you see that? Woe to the earth and the sea. We know that Satan, when he was bound, he even tells you in verse 17, he went off to still wage war. Is that right? Didn't say anything about when he was bound that this world turned into a panacea or in a garden of Eden. You see, we got all these people with the kingdom doctors saying, we're going to rule and reign over the nations of this world. That's a lie from the pits of hell. It is a perverted truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a, whole, that's a total blasphemy against the cross. You got people planning on ruling parts of this world with Jesus. It's awful. It's, it's, it's sad. Look what it says, please, again in one more place. The 13th verse. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman. That's a true church. Is that right? Who gave birth to the male child. And the male child is Jesus. And please don't forget, he wages war, even though he's bound, he can't stop the gospel, with two types, with people that do two things. Look at verse 17. He wages war with the rest of of her offspring just like Jesus was born from the church in a type of sense we too are born into the church is that right and so we talked about we were kin to him is that right so would you say that we're also from the same offspring born of the spirit of God he wages war with those who keep the commandments of God he wages war with those who keep and hold to the testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? The testimony of Jesus is, I died for their sins. And we hold that testimony. Are you seeing that this morning? And of course, the 13th chapter tells you the two instruments he uses to wage war, which of course, we've already covered this, it's on tape, with every government of the world, that's what Psalms 2 is about, and also every false church and every false doctrine. And I don't care if you're the one where you're speaking in tongues. 
Now he's bound. We know that. But still, it does not mean, it never did mean that God would stop him from his turmoil in the earth. It meant that God would bind him from causing the people's hearts to forever belong to him. It meant that God would give those that really wanted God, he would give them liberty to spend eternity with, with him. Is that making sense to you? Now, I want you to go please to Hebrews, the second chapter. What a beautiful chapter, the 20th chapter. How perverted, how twisted, how screwed up. Hebrews 2, notice verse 14 and 15. This whole doctrine is built on this thing about a thousand years. It's awful. Verse 14. Folks, again, this is talking about what happened to Satan because of the death of Jesus. And we all know that Jesus died on the what? Cross. We all know because of Jesus dying on the cross that we have a right to the tree of life. Is that right? Look at the 14th verse. How in the world can you believe this if you're waiting for this to happen to Satan a thousand years from now or way off in the future? Verse 14. Since then the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise also partook of the same that through what? Death. Everybody tell me. That through what? Death. Through death. Now stop and think about that. Which, what death is this talking about? Him being nailed on the cross. That through death he might render what? powerless. Folks, the term Satan being bound, does it not mean that Satan was rendered powerless? Does it not tell you right here that through his death he was rendered powerless? It's okay to say that through his death Satan was bound? He might render powerless him who had the power. Does that mean Satan no longer has the power of death? Who had the power of death? That term power of death simply means the power of sin. For the wages of sin is death. Is that right? And the soul that sinneth shall die. Is that right? That power was broken. Got a question for you. Did you sin? Yes, we all sin. But what happened? We went to the cross. Is that right? And so now we're called alive, quickened together with him. Is that right? That power was broken. I guess a way of putting it, and I'm not trying to add to God's word, the soul that sinneth shall die unless that soul runs and receives the work of the cross. Then it'll live. Look at this. He might render him powerless, him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those. Have you been delivered from your sins? And might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to what? Slavery. When the Bible talks about slaves, what is it talking about? Slavery of what? Sin. All their lives. Is that in your Bible? Again, before I go any further, was this pointing to the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus? Has everything I read so far pointed to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? Even when he said all power in heaven and earth is in my hand, was it because of his death, burial, and resurrection? Did he go before the Father and receive from the Father all authority in heaven and in earth? Is this making sense to you? Has all this pointing to when Satan was bound? Let's continue. Let's go back to the 20th chapter of Revelation. I wonder what the Christians are going to do when we, when they place us in this, in this country in concentration camps and begin to really kill us. I wonder what they're going to say. Lord, we're waiting for the millennium. Now we come to the fourth verse. Let me take a second and third again. Let's take the fourth verse. Now let's go back to the second verse. I might as well, I know we've hit it, but for the sake of those that's hearing the tapes, 
the newly seed we're going to shout about this thing a thousand years. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, verse 2, who's a devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. You might say he rendered him powerless. Is that right? Now, he threw him into the abyss, and he shut it and sealed it over him. And here's where he was bound, that he should not deceive the nations any longer. Is it there? Until when? The thousand years were complete. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Let's just spend a little bit more time again. I know this is re repeating for us at this church. Let's go back to Psalms 90 and read verse 4. Now, first of all, John told us when we begin this book that it was given to him in a language of signs and symbols. Is that right? The King James says signified it, which means language of signs and symbols. Even the numbers are signs and symbols. In fact, I think we were shocked when we saw what it meant by who the 144,000 were. Is that right? Signs and symbols. Same thing here. And God had something to say about a thousand years in his sight, how he saw a thousand years. Again, remember how God sees a thousand years, how I see a thousand years, totally different. In Psalms 90, look with me at verse 4. For a thousand years, here's the key part of this, in whose sight? In God's sight, or like what? Yesterday when it passes by. Or as a watch in the night. Notice again, in God's eyes, a thousand years is not how you and I see a thousand years. And everything we read in the revelation of Jesus is how God sees everything. Everything that we're seeing in the revelation of Jesus Christ is how God sees everything. One more place. Second Peter 3. Oh, this is such a delicious meal. I love it. I can never get tired of this truth. I'm, it's one of the strangest ones in the Bible. But every time I read this, I get energized. I mean, it, it hits me like no other truth. There's wonderful truths in here. But I can't think of anything that hits me like this truth. Second Peter. As we turn, they'll say with me, we're seeing how God sees a thousand years. We're seeing how God sees a thousand years. See, look at 2 Peter 3. Let's forget the seventh verse. Here's why I know that Jesus is not coming back to this earth to set up a, set up a kingdom. Look at the seventh verse. You see, if Jesus comes back to this earth and sets up a kingdom, then he becomes guilty of all the charges that was brought against him before Pilate by all the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. He kept telling them, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this realm. He said, my kingdom does not come with signs to be observed, but my kingdom will be in the hearts of man. Is that right? Look at the seventh verse here. But the present heavens and what? Earth by his word are being reserved for his kingdom. What does it say it's been reserved for? Fire. It's kept for the day of what? Judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And he told us whatever we had to do, don't let this one fact escape our notice. I'm going to tell you right now. We let it escape our notice, didn't we, folks? He says, do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day, key word, the word day there is of utmost importance. The word day there has to do with almost with everything and unlocking the scripture. One day is as what? A thousand years. So could you say that Satan was bound for a day? Is it okay to say that if I use the Bible to interpret the thousand years? And with in a thousand years as what? There it is again. One day. Twice the word day popped up in that passage. Is that right? Again, this has to do with salvation. How do I know? Because God is not, uh, what is the word schizophrenic? You know, it talks about one thing, they want to talk about something else. He's still talking about salvation. How do I know he's talking about salvation? Because of the next verse. 
He says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward, toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for how many? All to come to what? Repentance. Did Jesus, when he began to preach the gospel, say, repent and believe the gospel? Is that right? Did God say, I sent my son into the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Does that have to do with salvation? So right here we see that a thousand years talked about here has something to do with salvation. Can you say amen to that? Let me show you. So there should be something in here that would tell us something about the term day. There is. Say it with me. One day with the Lord, One day with the Lord. is the same, the same as a thousand years. years. Go to Hebrews 3. And let's see if we find this term talked about called day. You think we might? I find this scripture amazing because it's a scripture that was totally sealed in our hearts and it is still sealed in everybody's heart that's waiting for this thousand year physical literal reign to begin. And the Lord says very clearly here in Hebrews 3 verse 12, take care brethren lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart and falling away from the living, what? God. And then we come to some strange Holy Ghost spiritual talk. Notice verse 13. But encourage one another. That word encourage means to build up, to give aid or to strengthen or to cause to be strengthened each other in the body among you. But encourage one another. How? Day. Read it out loud. Day, day. after what? Day. day. Now don't miss that. Day after day. Day after day. Key word. As long, as long as it is still called what? Today. today. Is that a single day? Day after day as long as it is still called today. Lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's interesting. For if we have become partakers of Christ, excuse me, for we have become, we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, the beginning of our assurance was Jesus died for me and all my sins are forgiven. Is that right? Firm until the end, for it is said, here it is again, today, is that a single day again, people? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Again, we find this word in the fourth chapter, today, or the term day. And one day with God is a thousand years. The thousand years, all it ever meant was a day or a time or an era or a season or a span of salvation. A time when whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved because of the work of the cross. That's all it ever meant. That's all God ever intended for it to mean. In the fourth chapter, notice with me, Two verses. He again, verse 7, fixes a certain what? Now he tells you right there. He fixes a certain day. He calls it today. Saying through David after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another what? Day. day what? Yeah. After this. 
And again, that day has to do with salvation because the next verse talks about a Sabbath rest. And the Sabbath rest is for all of us who have ceased from sin. Is that right? Again, every time you find that word day or today, it's talking about salvation. And he says, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. See, the time when he was delivering his children from Egypt, God was calling it a day. You could have called that, well, I, I, could think, I, could, I could think of a good term to call that day for the children of Egypt, I mean of Israel out of Egypt. You could call it, it was their day of deliverance. For 40 years, they wandered around in their day of deliverance and never did come to deliverance. Are you seeing this now? And so the Lord tells us very clearly, we better be diligent, verse 11, to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. Why they disobey? Because they didn't believe God. Let me show you even something more shocking. Is it okay to say that the gospel has been preached ever since his apostles first began to scatter the face of the earth? Is it okay to say that? Mm -hmm. And would you also agree with me that in this day and time that we preach the gospel loudly and clearly and still we keep preaching to people that continue to walk in sin, that have heard the gospel, that continue to walk in doubt and unbelief, that have heard the gospel, they continue to walk in guilt and condemnation, that have heard the gospel. Is that my telling the truth? They continue to walk in all kind of criticism and accusation and gospel and slander that have heard the gospel. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. I want you to see again, the Holy Ghost calls it a day. Go to Romans 10, please. Notice the 21st verse, please. Read to me out loud, please, the first four words you see in that 21st verse. No, no, don't read that Through Isaiah it says. Okay. But as for Israel, he says. Read those next four words out loud. Folks. Look at me. What are we saying? That God only came down and in one 24-hour day gave his people a chance to come to him, gave him just 24 hours to come to him. Is that what we're saying here? Yeah. No. God calls a time when he offers salvation to us, he calls it a single day. And the day of salvation is coming to an end. And he says right there, through the prophet Isaiah, he says, all the day long I have stretched forth my hands. To a disobedient and obstinate people. Do you believe the Bible, folks? Let me ask you a question. One day with the Lord is that's what? So if I exchange this right here to all the thousand year long, I have stretched out my hand to disobedient and obstinate people, would you have any problems with that? It's quite obvious how God calls the word day and how he uses it. Am I telling the truth? To all the prophets, God calls it a day. And his people wouldn't hear. It's the same thing today. One more place. Hebrews 3. Notice verse 7 and 8. I want to prove it to you. I got a question for you. How long were the children of Israel in the wilderness? Guess what God called it? He called it a day. See, I want you to get used to how God speaks and how man speaks, how man lies. How man calls his knowledge and wisdom revelation 
God calls it darkness. God calls it lies. Hebrews 3, 7, 8. Today, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me as in... Would you read out loud those next four words? That was a day too, wasn't it? But God calls that the day of trial in the wilderness. God calls it a single day. And here God was talking about that day was 40 years. Folks, do you see the deception that has conquered God's people's hearts? You see, let me tell you what happens. When any of us buy the lie that Jesus is going to one day begin to reign and rule, what kind of king do we have? Why do we even call him king if he's not reigning and ruling? If he's not reigning and ruling, then he's a liar. He's not a king. Every king I ever heard of reigns and rules and has a kingdom and has dominion. Is that right? If we're waiting for him to begin to reign and rule, folks, then we're still damned for hell. Let me show you the scripture. Are we supposed to reign and rule with him? Yes. Mm -hmm. Go back to Psalms again, please. I got a question for you. Did Jesus say that the Father gave him all authority and all power after his death, burial, and resurrection? He did say that, didn't he? So, uh, would you say then that when God did that, he turned over all his power to the Son to delegate? Look at Psalms 110. I know these are scriptures that we in this church are used to. But for the sake of what we're talking about now, let's put it all together in one nice little neat package. And I'm living having to use overkill. I'm almost trying to give too much scripture to prove it. Just to drive out the lie that is so entrenched in our hearts. I'm doing it on purpose. In Psalms 110, again, I've talked to you before about this term, the Lord says to my Lord, have I not? The first Lord is spelled capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Is that right? Yes. The next Lord we see in that same sentence is spelled capital L, little O, little R, little D. Right? Whenever you find the capital L, the capital O, the capital R, the capital D, it means Jehovah God of covenant, one that has never broken a promise, one that is totally dependable and one that is totally faithful. The capital L, the little O, the little R, the little D means Adonai. It means master, owner, possessor, and the one that has the right to possess me. And the God who has never lost a battle, the God who has never been defeated. So we see something takes place here. The Lord, that's Jehovah Almighty God, says to my Lord, that's Jesus. And this term was given when he ascended to the Father. Is that right? The Lord God says to my Lord God, Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Now in verse 2 is one of the times when the translators use all capital when they shouldn't have, but it's all right. And the first thing Jesus does as, as our God, as our Savior, as our Shepherd, as our High Priest, he stretches forth his strong scepter from Zion saying, are we going to reign and rule with him? He says rule where? How in the world can this be the millennium if we check out our enemies all around us? If we're going to reign and rule with him, and they're telling us in the millennium camp that we got to wait till he sits on a kingdom, and then we're going to reign and rule with him, then something's wrong somewhere. Because he tells us, rule in the midst of thine enemies. And his people hear it, and the Bible says very clearly, 
Verse 3, thy people will volunteer freely in the, in the what? Day. In the what? Day, Day of what? Day. Of thy power. And how do they do it? In holy array. From the wound of the dawn. Folks, is that clear? Why is that so difficult to see? Again, we find the word day pop up. Did you notice that? Look at Psalms 2, please. Psalms 2. I love this 20th chapter. The 20th chapter is the beginning of me seeing things in a whole different light than I ever saw. Um, did Jesus stretch forth his strong scepter from Zion, telling us to rule? Mm -hmm. Psalms 2, verse 7. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. God made a decree. He said, Thou art my son. There's a term. Today. I have begotten thee. This is when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, folks. That's why he came to this world, folks, to reign the rule over the hearts of men as king. First John, the third chapter, and the eighth verse. Why did he come? Was it to bind the devil? Talk to me. Yeah. First John 3, notice the 8th verse. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. Is that right? Why was he begotten? The Son of God appeared for this purpose or for this reason. That he might want destroy the works of the devil. Is that why Jesus came? Did Jesus do that? Did Hebrews say that through death he rendered him powerless who had the power of sin? Did we also see that he set some captives free? Were we all captives of Satan? Had no way out? Yeah. See if this means anything to you. Go to Luke 10. When did all this binding begin? Luke 10. Verse 17. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Folks, do we see Satan fall? Don't miss this. This is when they were casting out demons. Remember that? How in the world could they do that? When Jesus was born to this earth, folks, the binding of the devil began. And it was completed at Calvary. And here's what Jesus says. Behold, I have what? How can he give power? He's got to have it. That's right, brother. I have given you authority to tread up on these serpents and scorpions. What was he doing? Take him out to the desert and saying, well, John, did you get a box of scorpions today so we can practice walking on, on scorpions? Mm -hmm. Peter, you bringing his snakes? Put them down there. Let's walk over them, guys. Here we go. He was talking about demons, wasn't he? Yeah. He's, I'm giving you authority. By the way, this is after he talked about seeing Satan fall from heaven. I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means injure you. He said, the disciples said, Lord, they're subject to us in your name. Authority 
in his name. Look at this. Something incredible happens to Jesus. I never really saw Jesus give out too much emotion of uh, showing excitement. Most of his emotions that I see in the Bible are very saddened. I see him as a man of sorrows, acquainted with rejection by men and grief. Here's one of the few times I find in the whole scriptures that Jesus jumped and shouted. In verse 20 he said nevertheless don't rejoice in this that the spirits, that these are evil spirits by the way, are subject to you but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven at that very time he rejoiced the Bible says greatly in the Holy Spirit and said I praise thee O Father, Lord of heaven and earth that thou did hide these things from the wise and the intelligent and did reveal them to babes yes Father for thus it was well pleasing in thy sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is. Except the Father. Who the Father is except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. He was even speaking that prophecy. All things are handed over to me by my Father. See if this makes sense to you. Go to the book of John. The Gospel of John. The 12th chapter. John 12, verse 27. You see, the way God sees time, I think you know now and I know, is totally different the way we see time. Amen? See, when you and I think of time, we think of it in our thoughts. Is that right? And yet our thoughts are not God's thoughts. You know the way that I think of the word hour is totally different the way God thinks of the word hour. Look what it says in the 27th verse. This is Jesus. And uh, it's one of those sad times for his life. I think it's when we see more of his humanity than ever. That he really was a man. He says in verse 27, now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say, Father? Save me from what? This hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. We've already saw John tell us his purpose was to destroy the works of the devil. Is that right? Jesus gave us his own testimony in Luke 4. He said to open the prison doors, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind. Is that right? So again, when this term hour, this purpose, is a whole lot in that, that term he just made. And then he makes another statement in verse 31. He said, now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. Got a question for you. Would you say that Satan was bound? Would you say his power was overthrown? What was he fixing to do in this hour? He to go to the cross, wasn't he? You see that all keeps pointing back? to the power of the cross and what the purpose of the cross is all about. Then he says, and if I be lifted from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. You see, before the cross, every one of us in this room was born to go to hell. Every one of us was born in Satan. Every one of us had been drawn into Satan. When Jesus was offered up for my sins and your sins, we were set free as captive from being in prison in Satan and we could run now into Jesus. Would you say that Satan was bound? This power to deceive us was broken. Would you say that? It's okay to say that. And the reason we know he was talking about the cross because verse 33 is very explicit. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. Do you see that? People, um, I find um, the Lord has much to say about Satan being bound. For example, go to Luke 11.
Notice verse 20. In Luke 11, verse 20, something here takes place. Now, I said to you that when Jesus was born to the earth, he began to bind the devil. Is that right? Let me show you something that took place. Let's go first to the 10th chapter. And it was verse 17 through 19. Have I given that already? I think I have. This one, he, he gave them authority to cast out devils, right? All right. Now, keep that thought in mind. Notice verse 19. He gave us authority to cast out devils, right? Then we come to the 11th chapter. And here he's being condemned by the Pharisees. Of course, who else? And then Jesus speaks to the revelation knowledge. I'm going to tell you right now, they don't hear him. He says in the 20th verse, if I cast out demons by the what? By the finger of God. Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And he explains it. When a strong man, the strong man is Satan, fully armed, guards his own homestead, the homestead, or our souls, his possessions, that means we were his property, are undisturbed. Before Jesus came into this earth, Satan was undisturbed. Is that right? Verse 22, but when someone stronger than he attacks him, and key word, overpowers him. Would you say he bound him? He takes away from him all his armor. Did Jesus tell us that the weapons and armor he gave us were stronger and greater than the weapons and the armor of our enemy? For we were roused not against flesh and blood. Remember that? In him are we stronger than Satan? Do we go around as a bunch of real cute, sweet, lovely club joining Pentecostal saying greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world we smile real sweet when we say it even though we have them bleeding to this point are we supposed to be stronger than the devil in Jesus we've made it a, a cute little phrase haven't we but folks there's a reality to that the Bible says he distributes his plunder does, does that look like a kingdom that's been demolished by Jesus? When he came to this earth, folks, he came to destroy the devil and the works of the devil in my life and in your life. And folks, he did it. Can you say amen to that? Let's go back to 20th chapter of Revelation. Why is it in explaining three verses it takes this long? Can I tell you why it takes this long? Because of all the lies that we bought. All the lies we bought from man. We come down to the fourth verse. And I saw what? Thrones. <laughs> I saw thrones. And they folks that day they, they're the people of God and they set up on them and judgment was given to them that means rulership was given to them and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded now folks I'm going to point something out to you during the time of this thousand years going on we see also during this time that there are martyrs for Jesus for example, some of y'all might know more about this than I do. When they began to obey the Lord and go into the world and preach the gospel, 
he was reigning and ruling. Is that right? He told him, he said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. What happened to James? He got his head chopped off. But the thousand years was on. Is that right? I think Thomas went to India, and wasn't he the one that was uh, speared through with a javelin? Was killed, martyred there. They were being beheaded for the, for the gospel. They were martyrs. Peter was crucified upside down. Is that right? What happened to some of the rest? Anybody know? Hmm? Yeah, Paul's head was chopped off. But it was during the time of him reigning and ruling. You see, notice. See, notice the line we brought of a panacea on the earth. Satan was bound then. But it was costing us our lives. Is that right? I remember over there in Acts, he said, the purpose of you receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost is to go out in all the world and make disciples. He told us that. Acts 1 8. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Then shall you become my witnesses. I wonder what has happened to the Spirit of God in those people who can't open their mouths and fulfill the purpose of why the Holy Ghost was first given. I wonder if he's really, really still with them like they think he is. I wonder why the Holy Spirit will stay with someone that's living a life that's totally contrary to the purpose of why God said he was given in the first place. He's then showing you be my witnesses. Is that what he told them? In Jerusalem and Judea and all Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that word witness is even the word martyr. Why do people don't witness? Because they're in love with themselves. And they're ashamed of God. So he says here, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark upon their forehead upon their hand and they came to what? Life. Folks, are you saved? Talk to me. Are you saved? Does that mean you came to life? And you reign with Christ for how long? A thousand years. Could you see you reign with Christ for a day? Heard that program called Queen for a day? These are kings and priests for a day. The day of the Lord. The day was reigning and ruling. And then, more shocking words. And the rest of the what? Now, again, I, I just want to show you again, for the sake of the tape, when God talks about people being dead, who is he talking about? Dead in sin. Look at Ephesians 2.2. 2. Let's go there for just an example. Ephesians 2.2. 2. I think I'll show you two places. I'll show you what Paul said also. Ephesians 2.2. 2. Let's take 2.1. That's where I should go. The rest of the dead, that means all the rest of the people never got their eyes open until the day of salvation was over. Remember when Jesus talked about the time when he began to close the door? Yeah. I'm telling you right now. I know we're in the middle of that time. I know the door is closing. In Ephesians 2, 1, it says, and when you were, what's that word? Dead in your what? Trespass and sin. That means all the people with sin problems in their lives never did come to the understanding until it was too late. They did not come to life until the thousands were completed and God said this is the what? First what? Resurrection. Now, folks, <laughs> I know you see it now. You know, we've, we've just went through a whole, what, uh, seven tapes on nothing but reigning in life as kings. I know you know what this means now. Go yeah. down in my mind. Part of the first resurrection, <laughs> first of all, let's look at the havoc that Satan would work still in the earth when Jesus is reigning and ruling. Daniel, let's go to that first again. It's Daniel 7. I don't have time. I do not have time. Father, we thank you for this first session. We bless your name. We know your word is truth. We know that Satan's final end is destruction of the lake of fire. We know also, God, we're going to see a final day of judgment for those that reject your reign in blindness. But yet, Lord, on the other hand, we accept this day of your salvation and we accept your work of redemption. And Lord, we look back at the cross and we accept the cross today stronger than ever before.